Welcome to another episode of Rome Direct. My name is Jan Benz from the EWTN News Rome Bureau. I'm sitting here with Father Robert Dodero, President of Rome's Patristic Institute, the Augustinianum, himself specialized in patristics and a consultant for the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith. Thank you, Father Dodero, that you're with us today. You're welcome. In these turbulent times, uh, you took the time to give us an interview. The Synod is coming up, is in fact beginning coming Sunday. Uh, it will last from Sunday to the 14th of October. This is an extraordinary Synod in preparation for the ordinary Synod in the coming year. Uh, this is a Synod of Bishops for Marriage and Family. Now, could you just quickly explain what, what is a Synod of Bishops? Sure. After the Second Vatican Council, Pope Paul VI decided that he wanted to convoke every few years representatives of the bishops' conferences from around the world to come to Rome to discuss a theme that was important for the government of the church. These synods have been going on since the 70s, the 1970s. And they're, as I say, they're held every few years. Bishops come from around the world and they meet and discuss various issues that are central to doctrine or to the, um, the government of the church itself. So uh, we're, what we're seeing now is a theme that's uh, very important uh, to Pope Francis and to a number of the world's bishops, that of the family and the new evangelization. In the Synod, what will happen? How does it look like? What is the day-to-day -day plan? Uh, it's actually not completely clear yet. Uh, one of the things that Pope Francis has tried to do is to change the structure of the Synod of Bishops because there was great dissatisfaction with the way that these had been carried on in, in recent years. They seemed too choreographed and for some too dominated by the Roman Curia. So what I think, I think you're right that this is, this is an extraordinary session so it'll have fewer bishops and fewer experts present than in the ordinary session a year from now. So what we'll see probably is a lot of talk about themes that should be carried forward for the fuller ordinary uh, session in a year's time. What is the outcome of a synod? Uh, what is the result of it? Will there be document? Normally, this is of course up to the Holy Father, normally uh, the Pope writes a document at the conclusion of the synod it's called a uh, post-synodal apostolic exhortation. And in that, he reflects on the propositions passed by a majority of the bishops during the synod itself. But this document is entirely up to the pope to, to determine content, form, length, um, and even, of course, whether or not to issue a document. So I can't say that we're even sure that we'll have a document after the ordinary session uh, next year's time. It, it's customary, but um, no decision or at least no announcement has been made about this yet. So does this concern the common Catholic in his or her parish? Absolutely, yes, because the themes concern all Catholics, marriage and family. And I think part of what Pope Francis wants to do is to bring an emphasis, a positive emphasis of joy. So how can the family, as the central unit of the church, St. Augustine called the, the domestic church. How can the family itself be a factor in spreading the gospel, the joy of the gospel to other families, to other people, Christians, non-Christians uh, throughout the world? Negatively, there are problems that the families, that families are encountering today. Marriages are breaking down. You have the problem of divorce. Um, we have other problems affecting families, including poverty and economic problems. So the Pope has set a wide agenda for this synod and all of these various problems can be discussed um, if the bishops who are attending the meetings wish them to be. Now there's a wide array of problems today that concern the family. Um, and will all of these be discussed in the synod? I mean, what, is, what do you think will be in the center of attention? It's still really difficult to say. I mean, the issue that I and, and others care about the most is that of, of divorce, remarriage, and Holy Communion, which is a, a matter which was brought up in the Instrumentum Laboris, in the preparatory document for the Synod, 
it was a it was a matter that was uh, subjected to uh, the questionnaires that were sent out to uh, Catholics uh, by the office of the synod in anticipation of this synod, and that may or may not be a a um, a major issue during the upcoming synod. We really don't know yet. Now, you editor of a book uh, that's called Remaining in the Truth of Christ, that's coming out now in Ignatius Press in English and in fact in four other languages, so yes. five languages overall. Um, in this book, you tackle a couple of problems, specifically the one uh, of the communion for remarried divorce that was originally brought up uh, by Cardinal Casper in the consistory at length in front of the cardinals and then now again and again in the media, everybody has been talking about it. Now, why do you see, why, why did you have the, the mm. feeling that this book needs to be written? Okay. First of all, we share with Cardinal Casper and with all bishops concern about the pastoral care given to divorced and civilly remarried Catholics. First of all, divorced Catholics who themselves suffer from the separation, the breakdown of a marriage, there may be children involved. Even before any question of second marriages enters in, we, we have divorced persons in the church. They require pastoral care. This question becomes complicated when divorced persons remarry, or you might say attempt remarriage, civilly, that is in, in a, a state-sponsored marriage or a state-recognized marriage, which is not recognized by the church. And in the case that their original spouse is still living, the church considers them still married to, those, to that original spouse. So there's a, there's a specific problem that arises in the case of divorced and remarried uh, Catholics. We share that concern with Cardinal Casper. We would like to see the church more active in welcoming, embracing, involving divorced and remarried Catholics in the full life of the church. Where we disagree with Cardinal Casper is on one point, and it's, I admit, it's an important one. The question of admission to the sacraments of penance and Holy Communion. Cardinal Casper has introduced um, a notion which is prevalent in the Eastern Orthodox churches of allowing, not recognizing as sacramental necessary, but allowing second and even third marriages. Cardinal Casper doesn't talk about third marriages, but he does talk about second marriages. In the Orthodox churches, with the permission of their bishops, such persons can have access to the sacraments of penance and Holy Communion. Cardinal Casper has suggested that the Catholic Church Follow the orthodox example. We oppose that. How does the practice look today uh, in the orthodox church? Are they happy with it? Because they have been practicing it for, for, for centuries, at least for decades. Uh, we have not had that kind of experience. Are they, are they happy that we, would this, for example, be a point of common interest, even mm. of, ecumen, of, of an ecumenical uh, connection? I don't know. One of the problems, and we, we speak about this in our book, um, one of the problems is that there's no one single orthodox position on divorce, on second marriages, on admission to the sacraments. That is, there's no one position, say, that, that characterizes all of the various orthodox churches. And even within individual or orthodox churches, the Russian orthodox church, the Greek orthodox church, the Serbian orthodox church, within the individual orthodox churches, there's not always agreement over this practice. You know, there, the orthodox system of, of thinking about theology and of, of teaching, their teaching authority is structured in a different way than it is in the Catholic Church. So you can't point to the orthodox and say, well, now this is, this is the official orthodox teaching on divorce and remarriage or, or second marriages or sacraments for second marriages. So what we're hearing in the Catholic Church, we're reading widely, we're reading Orthodox authors, we're talking to them, but there's, there's a, a low level of discussion. I mean, there's just not a lot of discussion about this in the literature amongst the Orthodox, whether they're theologians or bishops. Um, so one question is, is trying to figure out exactly what do the Orthodox today think in Russia, in Greece, in the United States, in Germany? Uh, what is the practice? How, how consistent in it is it? How coherent is it? 
it does what, what happens in one diocese, is that the same or similar to what happens in another diocese? How, how do they keep records? All of these questions really raise issues for the Catholic Church in trying, for example, to deal with mixed marriages, <clears throat> marriages between Orthodox Christians who are divorced and Catholic Christians, perhaps of the Eastern Rites. And we, we very often find that we are not able to understand the process, the grounds for which um, a divorce was granted or a, an, um, an annulment was granted. Uh, so there's, there's linguistic and there's uh, theological uh, confusion, I would say, uh, right now between among the Orthodox themselves and between the Orthodox and Roman Catholics. I have not heard senior Orthodox prelates applauding the Catholic Church for wanting to look more closely or even adopt their practice. So I don't know how much of a boon it would be to ecumenical dialogue. That's very interesting. Um, now, if I understand correctly, this is the oikonomia argument that Casper yes. brought. Uh, does he have any other arguments for his uh, thesis that some yes, of the... Yes, absolutely. Uh, we've concentrated in our book on oikonomia, that is, on the practice of... Uh, it has this slang expression, I'll use it. It's actually found in Cardinal Casper's uh, book, tolerating but not accepting second marriages. Tolerating but not accepting them. Um, and then allowing persons in those situations to receive Holy Communion. First of all, I want to be fair to Cardinal Casper. He doesn't suggest this is a solution for all divorced and civilly remarried Catholics. Just those, he says, who have demonstrated a faithfulness to the Catholic way of life, to Catholic liturgical practice, you know, even after they're, they're remarried. So he wants to discriminate, too, among uh, Catholics who say are divorced and remarried and say this may be a solution that can be adapted to some of them but not to others. I would not want to be in the situation of having to make those decisions. He also wants the so-called, and I say so-called because it's annulment is a, is a word that conf only confuses the, the discourse, but he wants to simplify the process of getting declarations of nullity on original marriages so that more Catholics will avail themselves of this process. And that's a suggestion that I think has a lot more support if, if, if we're all able to judge this from what's being said amongst bishops who, who will be taking part in the Synod. Uh, those are the, so those are the principally, principally the, the two ways that he wants to try to address this issue. And it, and it is an issue of, of divorced and civilly remarried Catholics um, so do you think that this, uh, his suggestion would put uh, in danger, put in jeopardy the indissolubility of marriage? I do. And so do the eight other authors in our book. That's the one thing that we all do agree on. The solution called oikonomia, which, which basically means you, you invite divorced and civilly remarried Catholics into a process of penance where they examine what went wrong with their first marriage. They repent of that. And they think out loud with a priest or a counselor, how can we avoid those situations in our second marriages? So it's, as it, if you will, therapeutic in that sense. But then to admit them to the sacraments, we believe that that violates the principle of the indissolubility of marriage because those individuals are already married, or at least one of them is, not just in the eyes of the church, but in the eyes of Christ. And we can't understand, we sincerely can't understand how Cardinal Casper doesn't see that. Going from the abstract to the concrete now, um, how would you think would maybe the, the children or a young couple, uh, what would happen with them if they go into marriage preparation? Yeah, this is, this is my nightmare. It, it really is. That if, if the, we'll call it the Casper solution, but if this is approved, and if the Pope accepts this at the end of this very long two-year or three-year, you know, before the document may be written, uh, process, um, then all of a sudden we've got two young people who go to their parish priest and say, well, we want to be married. And, and so the priest says, well, all right, we have this mar marriage course, which is obligatory. Fine, that's great, we'll do it. And then they, what do they hear? Well, they hear 
about the three enduring goods of marriage, exclusivity, faithfulness, and offspring. And get to uh, permanence, and the priest or the layperson leading this course will say, marriage is forever. It's until death do we part. We say those words and we mean those words. Because in the Catholic understanding of marriage, the two become one flesh, Genesis 2.24, the two become one flesh in Christ. So they are, they are, they are ontologically, they are really united to Christ. Their marriage bond goes through Christ. Now, so the, the priest or the leader says, did, did you understand that? Yes, Father, yes, Father, we ought to get that. And they leave the rectory or the hall or wherever they're having this course afterwards. It's okay, yeah, marriage is forever. But heck, mom and dad are divorced and remarried and they go to communion every Sunday. What's the big deal? The whole thing falls apart right there. I mean, if, if we're saying by admitting people to Holy Communion, well, we're sorry. Your first marriage broke down. It's painful. We know that. You're marrying. You, maybe you, you remarried to take care of children. These are all, you know, understandable situations that we face in the hundreds of thousands in the church, if not more. This is a real problem. But at the same time, we can't do that and pretend that marriage is indissoluble because we, this second marriage, Effectively has, effectively has the status of a valid marriage. And it's the sacrament of Holy Communion that says that. It's especially if you are on a kind of day-to-day -day life and you can, don't have the time to think about it that much. It's especially hard to, I guess, see. Um, right, see, Let, see let's be aspect. clear. I mean, we're all sinners. We're not singling out the divorced and remarried because they sinned. We all sin. The question is, can you go into the confessional? If you have grave sin, committed grave sin, you go into the confessional and you say this to the priest and he asks you, do you intend not to sin again? Now look, let's be realistic. I mean, everyone who says, yes, I intend not to sin again, really does in that moment, but also knows I'm human, I'm frail, I'm weak. I, I get this argument. So that the intention not to sin again is not a promise. It's not a vow. That it, it's, I'll, I'll do my best with the grace of God. I'm open to this. I want not to sin, but I know myself. In the case of divorced and remarried persons who would go into the confessional, they would not necessarily intend not to live together anymore, not to have sexual relations together anymore. That's what makes the sacrament of penance impossible. Um, Karina Casper, in a recent interview in Spanish, said that the gospel is not a codex of penal law. Um, and also he called uh, some interpretations of the teaching of the indissolubility of marriage and the discipline of the church fundamentalist. Uh, what would you retort? I agree with the Cardinal that the gospel is not a code of, of, of canon law, but it is a code of divine law. And we have to make a distinction between human laws, the laws that the church makes up, don't eat meat on Friday, it's a church law, and laws that are by divine law. Now, when Jesus unveiled his teaching on marriage in the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, um, he ran into incredulity on the part of the apostles themselves who said, you know, if this is the way it is, it's better not to marry. What was Christ saying before he said that? He said, Moses allowed you divorce because of the hardness of your hearts. But I say to you, in the beginning it was not so. This is Matthew 19. In the beginning it was not so. The two become one flesh. So what Jesus did was refer the apostles back to the texts in Genesis. And it's at that point that they say to him, well, if this is the way it is, it's better not to be. Who's the fundamentalist? You know, I, I don't think that you can find issues on which Christ speaks more strongly than 
than these issues, marriage issues, divorce issues, in three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, said, I, I, to the divorce, I, I want to marry people, to divorce, I, I want to say this, not I, but the Lord. You can almost see Paul trembling. Not, not I, but the Lord. It, you know, don't, don't blame me for this. This comes from the Lord. Um, Paul is also very clear when he is speaking in his own name and not in the Lord's name. So we have a problem. Um, how seriously do we take the Gospels? It's not a code of law, but how seriously do we take it? When I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was homeless. Do we now start to treat those as though, well, you know, those are suggestions. We, he didn't really mean it. I mean, it's, you know. Uh, what, what's left of the gospel when you start striking out things that Jesus said because, well, you know, I mean, we don't want to give them a fundamentalist interpretation. We don't want to, we don't want to be rigid. Talking about law, uh, there has been di dichotomy created between law and mercy. Yeah. Do you think that that is the case? In Christ's teaching, it certainly was not. The mercy was expressed in the law. Uh, today, it seems that uh, mercy seems to be in contradiction uh, with the dis discipline of the church as it is now. Do you see that? You know, Cardinal Casper wrote a book about mercy before he wrote this one called The Gospel and the Family. He wrote a book about mercy. Pope Francis praised this book. He mentioned it specifically at the first Angelus address he gave after being elected pope. I remember I was there. And made Casper's book a, best, a worldwide bestseller right away. Casper says this in his own book, that mercy can't be false mercy. Mercy devoid of truth is a false mercy. We have to be very careful. Yes, we have to be careful not to confuse mercy with sentimentalism or romanticism. Uh, you know, love but tough love sometimes. So we find mercy by submitting ourselves to the will of Christ. Each one of us, starting with this sinner, each one of us is called to conversion. Each one of us has stuff to figure out in his life. I don't like that divorced and remarried people are being singled out, and I do not like calling them adulterers, and I don't. But at the same time, in our desire to be inclusive and, and in our desire to help people who are really hurting, we can't betray the truth of Christ. To the woman caught in adultery, Jesus said, go and sin no more. He didn't say, go. Um, well, also what, what comes to mind is that uh, where's the mercy for the partner that has been left? Because in this situation, we talk somewhat about an abstract situation of two people separating that are per both perfectly content with a new situation that are perfectly leaving in peace. Whereas I would imagine that in reality, it's mostly people being left, well, because they, they, they got pregnant uh, or, or, or I don't know, something didn't work out. Yeah. Yes, something was planned. So I was wondering, well, wh where is the mercy for the woman left behind or for the man left behind? Yes, yeah, this, is, this is another way. Mercy and justice. Mercy and truth, mercy and justice uh, have to accord with one another. What is, your, uh, what is your expectation now for the Extraordinary Synod that is coming up? Uh, what, what would you wish that is being discussed and uh, what would you think maybe uh, will influence or how will it influence the Pope? Well, uh, the Holy Father, uh, over a year ago, when he flew back to Rome from Rio de Janeiro at the end of the World Youth Day, that World Youth Day, said that he thought that this was a, a, a kairos of mercy, a time of mercy. It's been the theme of his pontificate. When he referred to oikonomia, when he referred to this proposal that has now become the concrete proposal of Cardinal Casper, he acknowledged that it had been around. And I want to remind everybody, it was Pope Benedict who brought this up, too. This doesn't originate with Pope Francis. Actually, the idea of oikonomia goes back to the Second Vatican Council, but that's for another, another program. Nevertheless, the Pope said this should be studied. Now, I, I think if our book does anything, and the conflict between our book and Cardinal Casper's book and other books uh, that have been written on this subject. And 
you see, I'm, I'm an academic, so I, I believe in study. I believe in debate, discussion, open debate, open discussion between people who are concerned with the truth. Yes, with mercy, but also with the truth. Let's understand the scriptures together. Let's understand the early Christian tradition together. Let's understand the history and the current doctrine of the Orthodox churches together as a church before we make any rash judgments or decisions. If the, if the Synod decided to just put off the question, and I know this will be hard for a lot of people, but if, if, if nothing else, I think we're showing that there are, there are unresolved issues that this question opens up. The same could be said about simplification of the annulment process. The Holy Father has named a commission to study that. Fine, I'm, I'm sure they'll do their work. Other Synod Fathers, or Synod Fathers rather, will speak to that issue during the Synod. So I hope that the controversy that has surrounded this issue and these books will serve the purposes of the Synod, will help to make the Synod a more well, a better moment of walking together, which is what synod means. I hope that there will be a deeper communion between all the bishops of the church and between bishops and uh, faithful in the church as a result of the controversy that has led up to this synod. Great. Well, let's hope that the greater unity will be achieved. Father Dodero, thanks uh, for being with us today. And You're very well. well Let's hope for the best for the Senate. Thank you. Thank you.